Einstein says you can't go faster than the speed of light. If you've ever wondered why that is and maybe tried to Google for an answer, there's a good chance you've come across an explanation like this. The faster you go, the more your mass increases, and the more energy it takes to push you that much faster, until eventually you need infinite energy to go faster than light. This explanation is more or less consistent with the math of special relativity, but I think it misses something important about the theory, the relativity part. Explanations like this give you the impression that something weird happens to you when you move quickly. Time slows down, lengths contract, and so on. But the big idea of relativity is that any speed is as good as any other. There's no one true correct frame of reference, so you're never just moving quickly, you're moving quickly relative to something else. And most importantly, you never notice the effects of relativity on yourself. You notice them for the something else you're moving relative to. Thought about this way, relativistic effects like time dilation are a glimpse at a different side of physical objects, and speed is something like an orientation. Not in space, but in space-time. When thinking about the effects of orientation, I like to imagine a nice plain dartboard in front of me. If you're a competent darts player and everything is set up normally, it's probably fairly easy to hit the board. But if the dartboard is rotated away from you, it's suddenly a much harder target. Now, you're probably not surprised by this development, but think about it abstractly for a moment. The dartboard itself hasn't changed. It's still the same diameter and shape. So why is it harder to hit? The mathematical explanation is that you were never directly interacting with the size of the dartboard in the first place. You were aiming for the projected size, which is determined by your angle to the board. If you draw a right triangle with the board's diameter as the hypotenuse, the bottom leg of the triangle is the projected width. And as we know from the Pythagorean theorem, the legs of a right triangle are always shorter than the hypotenuse. If you want to calculate the length of that projected diameter, you can use trig functions, which encode all the possible leg lengths of a right triangle for a given angle. So you just multiply the board's diameter by the cosine of the angle, and you get the reduced width of the board. Reassuringly, a cosine of 0 degrees gets you 1, a full-size dartboard. But of course, no matter how you rotate the board, its diameter remains constant. Only the projection changes. This physical reality is handily expressed by the Pythagorean theorem, which can be rearranged into an expression of distance. This formula, r equals the square root of x squared plus y squared, fix any point on the xy plane a distance r from the origin, giving you the expression for a circle. The idea here is that it's not strange or problematic that the projected length changes for each observer, because every angle represents a point on a circle, and a circle is a statement of the invariance of distance. Okay, we've gotten pretty far afield from relativity here, or even our dartboard. But we're going to carry over these ideas about rotations in space to rotations in space-time. There's a problem, though. If time dilates and lengths contract depending on your frame of reference, we can't rely on our trusty circle and the invariance of distance. Instead, we have to rely on light and the other big idea of relativity. Every inertial observer always measures the same speed of light, no matter how fast they're moving relative to the light source. In this new regime, distance and time are subservient to light. If light moves at the same speed for every observer, this formula is true in every reference frame. Consider Alpha Centauri, for example, which is about four light years from Earth. Let's just deal with one spatial dimension, x. Unsurprisingly, that means it takes light four years to reach us from Alpha Centauri, but those measurements, four light years, four years, are only true in our reference frame. No matter what frame you're observing from, however, there will always be no, or zero, difference between the distance that separates two events linked by light and the light travel time between those events. Notice that we're talking about events in space-time rather than points in space and that we're mixing together travel time and distance as if they're interchangeable. But what happens if we consider events that aren't linked by light? In that case, there would be a non-zero difference between the distance and light travel time. If you sit on the couch and watch a movie, there's an interval between the start and the end, even though you don't go anywhere. That duration is called a time-like interval in relativity. At the other end, say lightning strikes midway between two observers, such that they hear the thunderclap at the same time. 
There's no time between the two events, but there is a physical length. That's called a space-like interval. Just as light-like events have an interval of zero for all observers, time-like and space-like events have a constant interval as well, whatever it may be. This interval, S, is called unimaginatively the space-time interval. What changes from one observer to the next is how big a slice of time and space, the projection of the interval, they see. Like the distance formula, this equation for the space-time interval also represents a shape. Not a circle, but a hyperbola. While the equation for a circle preserves a distance, the hyperbola preserves a difference. As long as that difference, s squared, is maintained, the hyperbola can go on forever. Every orientation you can have in spacetime is represented by a point on the hyperbola, and the hyperbola is a statement of the invariance of the spacetime interval. To see how this gives rise to time dilation and, ultimately, no faster than light travel, Let's imagine you're sitting on an empty space-time diagram when a UFO appears next to you. In an attempt to communicate, it flashes a light every four seconds. It's hovering, not moving, relative to you, so the space-time interval between flashes is just a length of time, four seconds. Now let's suppose instead the UFO is flying away from you at 60% of the speed of light. This speed, or space-time orientation, is represented by a line that moves three light seconds to the right for every five seconds that pass. If the UFO is still flashing its lights every four seconds in its own reference frame, then we can draw a hyperbola representing a four-second space-time interval and see where it intersects our view of the UFO. That point determines what we observe. The projection onto our frame of reference shows that time has been dilated. We see the lights flash every five seconds. Just as with rotations through space, these hyperbolic rotations in space-time have a set of trig functions for calculating how big a slice of space and time you see between two events. The factor of time dilation, labeled with a gamma, is equal to the hyperbolic cosine, or cosh, of your, that's right, hyperbolic angle. We'll get back to that angle in a moment. But finally, let's try to answer the original question. Why does Einstein say you can't go faster than the speed of light? In the realm of hyperbolic space-time rotations, the question is ill-posed. A better question is, why don't you ever observe anything moving faster than the speed of light relative to you? When you accelerate, when your relative speed increases, what you observe moves to a different point along a space-time hyperbola. We saw that when the UFO started moving away at 0.6 c. So what determines how far along the hyperbola you go? It's that hyperbolic angle. Accelerating changes your hyperbolic angle, your orientation in space-time, relative to UFOs, stars, dartboards, and everything else. On a space-time diagram, the hyperbolic angle is the area between your speed and the hyperbola of whatever it is you're moving relative to. Constant acceleration, as measured by whoever's doing the accelerating, increases the area, the angle, by an equal amount for every second that passes, but it doesn't increase speed by an equal amount. Why not? Because each increment of equal hyperbolic angle is narrower than the last. The farther out you go, the taller the hyperbola gets, corresponding to ever more extreme time dilation, so you need narrower and narrower slices to get the same area. A narrower slice means your orientation, your relative speed, rotates by less and less with each passing second of acceleration you observe. You never see anything accelerate past the speed of light relative to you because acceleration is a hyperbolic rotation in space-time. And at the extreme end of the hyperbola, you see an infinite amount of time pass before a second goes by on the frame of what's moving. Why can't you go faster than the speed of light? Because you don't have the time.